Hello, uh, I am being joined today by Ben Plasper, who is a conductor, and I think, Ben, you're going to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a conductor, uh, mostly working in opera. Um, uh, I'm the music director of the Folks Opera in Vienna and the Opera de Rouen in Normandy. Uh, those are my two main jobs. Uh, and I've known Peter actually for a, a rather long time. And yes, very, very glad to call Peter a friend and colleague. It's, it's a privilege to be able to, to come on this and, and chat to Peter about composing and conducting and making music together. I mean, I've never written anything as long as a symphony before. I mean, I've written, I've written quite a lot of small stuff. Yeah. Up to, I wrote, actually, I wrote some orchestral stuff early on. Just over a year ago, I wrote a Requiem, which is oh, wow. reasonable size, about 20, 25 minutes, I suppose. Um, and then I just got this sort of thought of writing a symphony. And unlike, you know, happens with many of these mad ideas, I, I sort of kept on thinking about it and uh, gradually started making it happen. So as soon as you say symphony, that has a distinct meaning. So it has a, a musician, a non-musician, has some understanding of, of what that is. Yeah. And there's sort of certain expectations, I guess, about what it is. I mean, it must be, well, I was just thinking it must be in some ways kind of terrifying, but also in some ways quite liberating, the sense that you, that there's a whole tradition to draw on. How do you approach the kind of, how many movements you do and what kind of the structure and what, where do you get that from? Well, a key decision I made very early on was that I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. The people who have tried to invent reinvent musical wheels and always done that brilliant a job or it hasn't gone down terribly well in some sense or other i i just feel yeah i'm in a tradition of goodness me can i mention myself in the same same breath as beethoven and Mahler and tchaikovsky and people like that who one thinks of as the great symphonists within our tradition and that is a an immense privilege, but b like you said, it gives you some some clues to where you're going. So I thought, right, four movements, easy. And in fact, I remember a conversation with Duncan early on where I sort of said, well, I think the first movement is going to be like this, and the second movement is going to be like this, so forth. Of course, it hasn't worked out quite like that. Right. But but you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, so the third movement is a scherzo. I'm not going outside of what is actually fairly normal in that sense. Do you compose? Have you ever composed? I have done a bit in the past, but I find it so difficult. I really find it difficult. The last time I composed was during my degree, so that was a fair few years ago, and uh, I kind of scraped a pass on the composition <laughs> paper. Is it something you wished you had done more of or would like to? It's something yeah. I, wish I, I wish I was better at. But to be honest, given the the limited success that I've had with it, I'm quite happy to leave it to people who who know what they're doing. I love being the person who premieres a piece. That is a that is something I love doing. Right. Um, and especially if you're, you know, if it's a new opera or something or a new bigger work where you can be in contact with part of the creative process, that I love. Um, nice. Yeah. I think the most the most recent thing that I did, which brand new, was a new oratorio that was written by an Argentinian composer. We just did it in France at the end of last season, and that was amazing because he was um, he was incredibly clear, but also very open. And we it was it, I really felt like I was able to have an input in the the way the piece was put together in the final stage. Once you know, once he'd kind of created this this piece. Uh, it felt like we could really make it together. And even in the rehearsals, you know, it was, he was really open to suggestions. That, that kind of aspect of, of, it, of working with a composer I love, but right. I don't have the inspiration to, to, to actually put an idea on, on paper and then develop it. Um, yeah. I think, you might, I, think, I think you'd be surprised, actually. Uh, but, but can I, actually, I'd like to ask you more about that. So, for example, with this this oratorio or, or other experiences you've had of of actually working with somebody, yeah, can you give some examples of you know what actually what has happened practically? I mean, you mentioned there that this chap was open to ideas, yeah, 
Yeah. How has that sort of practically worked out? Well, it varies. I mean, often it's kind of simple, practical things that, you know, if we're rehearsing and quite clearly there's going to be balance issues with certain passages and kind of suggesting, is it possible for us to thin out a texture? And sometimes he'd say, no, no, I really need, I really need it there. And we kind of try and find a way to rehearse it. But often he would say, actually, let's try that. And actually it worked really well. And he was really happy with that. So things like that I really enjoyed. And, you know, and then other things, whether it's, can we leave a little bit longer here? Maybe a tempo suggestion. I wonder if because of the harmonic movement that you've given us, could we move it a bit more? What do you think? And things like that. Right. And then he might yeah. slightly change a, how a tempo marking is written uh, for the orchestra. You know, if something's not working, for example, and they say, well, this is what I want. Do you think there's another way we could get to that effect? For example? Right. It sounds rather similar to me to when a conductor, so, I mean, I'm a strength player. So if I'm standing on the box there and I'm looking at the, the uh, trombones, I'm not going to tell them, I'm not going to give them technical information. Yeah. I've never played the trombone ever. Well, I have no hands-on experience. So I'm going to say to them, could you make, could you make a brighter colour there, please? Yeah. So maybe it's a little bit like that, that you're feeling the composer is giving you something to run with and you're saying well actually what we need to do is this you know if you're working on a new a new production of something and there's a kind of a dramaturg who's there to advise the director if the concept's not clear or if there's an idea that could be expressed in a different way i feel yeah. like that's often the role of a conductor when you're working with a composer is to kind of help them sometimes clarify what they want for the orchestra and for, and for the audience it's a creative role, isn't it? It's not. It, it's not quite the sort of role that we tend to think of conductors having. Of you know, I've got Beethoven's score. I just do what Beethoven said. There's a, actually there's an interaction going on. It's, well, as long as you don't have a composer that says, "Don't interfere, just do what I say." Well, exactly. It depends. It depends on the composer, and I think it depends on the conductor. I don't think con some conductors probably wouldn't necessarily want to be in, involved in that way, and. There's a, a brilliant young French composer called Camille Pepin, um, and we worked together a lot. And we recorded a disc of all of her, all of her orchestral pieces, actually, that she'd written up until that point uh, last year. Um, and it was such a great experience of kind of, you know, even simple things like, you know, I suggested, you know, could we try having split violins because of the kind of the way you've written the, right. the and her and her saying okay great i'll put that in the score for when it's performed again because it works i had the interesting experience of, uh, the other day of going to see a chamber group and they said you know would you like to come along to rehearsal so i went along to the rehearsal they sort of went through it and then looked at me and said well was that was that right and, and, and i'm sort of trying to say well actually i loved a lot of what you did if it were me i would have done this bit slightly faster or, or something like that but I I don't like to put it in a it must be like this yeah, yeah. sort of manner because I, I I feel that that there has to come a point I think for a composer to say right that's it I've done it and then other people make of it what they make of it I mean I've got got a picture of uh, Marla on the wall up there just looking down at me very suspiciously uh, you know like Marla who, who tinkered with his music ev virtually every time yeah. Some pieces were performed. He was sort of changing this harp note and that double bass note, as you, as you probably know. And I, I totally understand that when you're that wrapped up in it, yeah. as like he was. But I feel you've got to let go. Yeah. I think it's easier when the composer is, is no longer around because... <laughs> how, how many ways do people play Beethoven 5? I mean, in a million different ways. And that's from the same set of dots on the page. And I mean, obviously, if, especially for a first performance, you want to make sure that the piece is, you know, to, to a certain extent uh, in line with your vision of it. But I think to trust performers is something that some composers do really well. And, and I love it. And it means it gives you the spaces as a performer to really feel that you're creatively involved in something. Sort of memories of conversations with people about you know, like Ravel for example I think it was Ravel anyway said you know you don't have to interpret my music you yeah just play what's on the page every every aspect of human existence is interpretation I don't think there's any such thing as as kind of 
because every human being is different. There is, you yeah. cannot possibly have an objective response. There's, there's no kind of one size fits all response to anything. I think we all, yeah. you know, I mean, I've been to watch, for example, a theater play that I heard that my wife and I went and we thought it was one of the worst things we've ever seen. And then we talked yeah. to some friends to see the night before and thought it was one of the best things I've ever seen, you know. <laughs> individuals respond so differently and it depends on the time of day. I mean, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to think that I'm better than it, but at the same time, I know that if I've had, uh, you know, a bad night's sleep, I will probably conduct in a slightly different way to how I would have done if I'd had a good night's sleep and, and a double espresso. The human body is fallible and, and therefore interpretation is a natural part of that. If he writes piano espressivo, what what the hell does piano espressivo mean? Like, to to me, it might mean with it, with an element of rubato, but to someone else, that might mean actually that the the espressivo comes entirely from the the, the quality of the stroke rather than from the tempo flexibility. Um, and if you're a cello player, piano espressivo just means play loudly. I mean, you know, <laughs> you, um, with with lots of vibrato. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, al allowing performers to really. Not to think they know it better than the composer at all, but just to have the freedom to have agency and ownership over over the piece. Yes. Do you know Derek Cook's book, The Language of Music? I know of it. I've not read it, but I but I know of it. I really recommend it. It's a, oh. I mean, it's probably 40, 50 years old, I guess. And essentially, I think he 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 gives a really cogent, strong argument for saying that diatonic music fundamentally has a meaning. Mm. He goes, for example, there are several chapters about intervals, and he goes through the fifth, the minor sixth, the whatever, and he gives dozens of examples from musical literature and says, here, 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 here. Every time it has the same meaning. Right. Um, and so he tries to build up, if you like, what the language of music is. Now, he only goes so far. He says, like, you know, you can't put music into words. That's not his point. But his main point is that there's a very clear emotional meaning behind music. Now, I, I know people who completely disagree with that. Mm, right. Who say, no, this is, this is pure sound. Don't confuse to th things of two uh, different types. Where, where would you stand on that? I, de I definitely think that music has a meaning to some extent. I'm not sure I'd necessarily go so far as to say that a specific interval means a specific thing in all cases, but at the same time, you hear a perfect fifth and a rising perfect fifth, and that has certain connotations of it, doesn't it? Of nobility, of fanfare, of whatever. I mean, there are, there are musical kind yeah. of ideas that do have connotations with them i think i think it's really personal um and i think it's interesting that especially if you look at something like something very simple like a, a mozart second movement that could be in, even in a major key and even though it's in a major key there could be a huge amount of sadness in it for certain people i think music has a really personal meaning and i think i very rarely would say to an orchestra for example it should sound like x picture because i think that's it Posing your own personal view on it, but I think, but I would often have that picture in my head when I'm trying to to work on that music with someone. I do think that that there is something about the essence of music, even purely absolute music, you know, something that has no program whatsoever. I think if it makes you feel something, it must have a meaning. If that makes sense, even if that meaning is entirely personal. Yeah, um, yeah it does make sense. Yeah, so I th I think it's I think it's quite subjective. But I do think that there is something there. I think we need meaning. I think we crave meaning and we crave story. I think story is like a key element of human existence, isn't it? Even absolute music produces a story. A symphony takes you on a journey. There is a story to it, even if it's not a narrative in the conventional sense. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. I'm, I'm just thinking of Vaughan Williams' six, E minor symphony, which oh, is the piece I always play to people who tell me they don't like Vaughan Williams. Ah, uh, yeah, as well, it is... A, but it's also it's it's not at all what you expect from Vaughan Williams. It's no. you know and the first movement is in E minor, but it starts with a really powerful sort of F minor chord over E minor or something. It's really yeah. written, I think, towards the end of the the war. Yeah, and everybody went, oh, obviously about the war. 
and the last movement is sort of like post-war, almost like apocalyptic scene. You know, everything's being destroyed, and everybody was sort of giving it these meanings. And Vaughan Williams said, "Listen, guys, I'll do chap just write a piece of music." <laughs> yeah, but then at the same time, even he will have surely well, he will have been affected by what was going on in his life, and that would influence his music. But then it, I'm also not one of those. Yep conductors that thinks we need to look at the biographical detail of every single piece you know and and I, I get kind of quite frustrated when people say oh well he wrote this at this time so therefore blah 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 and I think to some extent of course Vaughan Williams is right that you can you can just you can just write a piece of music yeah uh, but I, I think that there is this I think it's both both things are true at the same time that that music doesn't need to have a meaning but I think it does and I think it yeah. can that different people have different meanings. Another another thing that crops up in my mind is the Schubert Octet. Right. Beautiful, beautiful, sunny. You know, apart from one section, I think it's just some of the sunniest music I can possibly think of, written at a horrendous time during Schubert's life. And then he comes out with this incredibly happy sounding stuff. So, yeah, you know, you talked a bit about composers who you've worked with, literally been in the same studio, the same concert hall with. Do you ever sort of think, look, Marla, why? Or whoever, why? Can, can you tell me? Can you explain, explain this to me? Are there, can you think of anything, any composer you just sort of wish you could ask something? I've got one very bizarre one, but I think I would ask Mozart why in the whole of Nozze di Figaro, the only number that is properly in a minor key is Barbarina's aria about a lost pin. And yeah. even with all of the complex social politics and everything, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Nothing sits in a minor key except this tiny little arietta about losing a pin. Why is it? Does it? It gives it a significance that it feels is very unusual. And I wonder. I would ask him. Yeah, why the hell is that in in a minor key and nothing else? Great question. Maybe, maybe it related to some specific event that he found quite dramatic. I mean, who yeah, knows? Maybe. I just yeah. I'd love to know. I'd love to know. <laughs> So I, I remember going once to chat to a musicologist who was at the University of Surrey at the time, and he was doing a lot of research into various things to do with Marla. They'd written a book about Marla Three, and I went to talk to him about Marla Three. Uh, I was about to conduct it, I had never done so, and I just wanted to chat to him. And he said to me, gosh, you know, it's great that we've we're having this conversation about Marla because I find that most conductors aren't that interested. But you don't sound like that to me. You sound like you you are interested in that side of it. Well, I think especially if I take Marla for example, for example, his his journey with faith. I don't think you can really understand his music without at least having some awareness of that that yeah. part of his life. Things like that are kind of essential, really, if you're going to do it. I think it's possible to play music without that awareness but I think it enriches your awareness to understand those kind of bigger themes of, of a composer's life and it brings you closer to at least being able to have a conversation with them and say what were you thinking here if that makes sense. Yeah I understand completely it's sort of similar to what you're saying but surprising do you know that um, the argument which I've forgotten his first name a chap called Paley came up with for the existence of God he said if you're walking on, along a beach and there on the sand, you come across this watch, beautiful watch. You pick it up, it's ticking. I mean, I can't remember quite what he says, but you know, you see, he said, you're going to pick up that watch and assume that somebody made it. Yeah. You're not, not going to go, oh, this just sort of washed up. It sort of came about by the sand, uh, aggregates of sand and this and that seaweed coming together. No, you're going to go, somebody purposely made that thing. In a sense, you're saying a similar thing I think about a piece of music you're not just going oh look here's a symphony by Mahler but you don't even notice the name in fact you yeah, know yeah. a lot of dots on it let's just play the dots yeah um, it, it's got a connection hasn't it to other it stuff does have absolutely and I think the other side of that is that it can then have baggage and you know I think for example I, Mar uh, Wagner is what springs to mind and you know I think a lot of people hear the name and then they think kind of Woof, and everything is slow and loud and big and 
that I think can get in the way of actually trying to bring about what's on the page. So yeah. I think you get weighed down by the baggage of, of who a composer is. And with Wagner, I don't really want to know much about the the person because the more you find out the less you like him and actually yeah. that shouldn't stop you from being able to to play his music but but i do think with with marla you know learning about his his kind of faith journey is really important and i think with with beethoven i think the deafness is relevant i think it's really yeah. of course it's interesting to find out you know at what point in his life he started going deaf and what that and just to him you know even purely kind of uh, just to Im imagine in your, your yourself, what what might that be like? What what would that mean yeah. for a musician, for an artist? Because of course you've got a you've got a serious balancing act to do as a conductor, haven't you? You you know you've got to produce a show, yeah. You've got to produce a performance. If you don't do that, you've not done your job properly. You've got to prepare the singers, the 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 orchestra, etc., to to perform at a certain point. I would expect when you're conducting the sort of stuff you're doing now, you're doing a lot of opera, you probably don't have a lot of time for research and investigation of backgrounds and biographies and stuff. It's, it's not, not as true. much as I'd like. No, I think yeah. that, um, I mean, it depends on the project, but that's OK, because there's also lots of people who, who have the knowledge that you can tap into when, when you need it. Can I take you back to, to Wagner? <laughs> you may not want to take him back to Wagner. No, no, well... Yes. You're, you're, you're bringing up Wagner. Wagner is an interesting one. So my, my family is is Jewish by background, and right. I know my grandparents very, struggle very much with the idea of me playing Wagner's music as as the the, the 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 war generation. So for all of the connotations with, you know, Hitler and Wagner's music in that era, and I think it's becoming now, a few couple, two generations later, it's becoming a lot easier there because I think we are we're more divorced from the the experience of it. But it's interesting. I mean, you know, there are there's so much in the music of his hatred as well. I mean, like, like Meistersinger, which is one of my favourite operas of his, the character of Beck Messe is, is a horrific stereotype of a, of a Jewish character. And, you know, I mean, it's problematic. He's the character yeah. that is one of and... You, you have to find your way around that. And I know, you know, certainly some, some Jewish directors have done productions of it where they, you know, either found a new way of presenting it or really highlighted it. And I think mm -hmm. as long as you're aware, I think it's important to maintain uh, the culture. I think he wrote some of the greatest music of all time. And I think, I think it's important to still do because I think it's an important part of the canon in terms of history. I think if you take Wagner out of classical music in inverted commas history, yeah. there's a gap of, of logic. But I also think, you know, we shouldn't shy away from talking about the unsavouriness of, of, the, of the man. Yeah, that's interesting, actually, what you said about your grandparents um, and now a couple of generations later, the distance we have from it. That always makes a difference doesn't it now whether that's a reason to say well because we're now two generations later it's all fine i mean I, you know we're not saying that but it's sort of washed clean because there's a a sort of distance with you know some of the um some of the the aesthetics some of the the reference if you like of wagner is very 19th century yeah and and we can feel very different and very distanced a lot of the the human emotion and all of that is is very current. I mean, that's no different. I'd love us to, to be in a place as a society where we can hold two two things at the same time that kind of seem to contradict each other, but actually don't. I think it's just it's just a complex grey world of of human existence with where art is in some ways incredibly bound up in human nature and incredibly separate to human nature. And I think this, these are really interesting conversations that should be had, but the, yeah. the conversation rather than edict. I completely agree. What, what do composers do that makes your life difficult or, or what do they do that makes it easier? Yeah, clarity either the composer doing it themselves or getting a copyist to make sure that it's legible and that the page turns are not in stupid places, things like that that can waste rehearsal time. Um, errors, yeah. um, it's quite frustrating, composers constantly coming up saying, oh, sorry, that should be a C sharp, that should be blah, blah, blah. If, you know, they've not proofread a, a piece, that can be frustrating. Yeah. Uh, uh, composers suggesting you rehearse things in a particular way can be quite frustrating. Um, right. But most 
time it's just nice to have their input I have to say I mean sometimes for example if something is written and it could be articulated in a clearer way in the writing of it that that can be frustrating but at the same time I think composers should have a right to articulate something however they want I'd say nine times out of ten it's just great to have the contact with a composer so I mean for me it's a sort of it's an all you know an all-round thought at least that's my aim my aim is to think what does this feel like to perform? Mm -hmm. What does this sound like to listen to? I, I want to have a feeling that there's a reality to it, if you like. I think it's sometimes obvi obvious when a composer really doesn't play or has never played in an orchestra or hasn't done the homework. Um, so Camille, the composer I mentioned earlier, she's great when she writes for percussion. She, she has a, a close friend who's a professional player. That practical awareness is great and you know sometimes composers don't put that that work in I love that she does that so it's sort of practical things are really at the top of the yeah. list there that's no no different to what I'm thinking of really so then I've almost done two sort of trips through my score now I feel like I've got the bulk of it and the next trip is actually to look at the individual parts and to say, well, the first thing is, oh, I haven't given enough to the Saint Obo. They're going to, th they're going to think, why did I bother turning up this evening? Because they've got so little to do. And then, yes, stuff like are the page turns in the right place, all of the the very very basic stuff. It's it's very it's an intensely practical means of getting across something that transcends, you know, practical nature i think i have a friend uh, a, a very fine violinist friend who whenever i talk to him he says how's conducting going peter he says have you forgotten the first rule of conducting and i always pretend i have i said no 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 what is it he says don't get in the way yeah we all know what it's like when a conductor just <laughs> yeah. interferes on a level which they shouldn't interfere at the job of the the conductor is to produce that package that performance yeah. at the end of the day and maybe it's a little bit the same for a composer a composer just, just do your job don't get in the way just produce yeah. stuff that everybody can understand and read easily first time without having to do masses of uh, extra stuff do you, do you feel that's ever a problem um i think there's got to be room for complex and simple so the writing can't be too too complex. Um, so I think it's about working out who you're writing for. Um, and I think, to be honest, the, the simpler the writing, the more performable it is. Yeah, I mean, I, I have very much in mind the people who are going to perform my symphony. Who's it with? Who, who's doing uh, it? Peter Fender and Friends. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are two elements to that for me in terms of composition. One is I completely agree with what you just said about, you know, it's good to have simpler and more complex music, but taking into account the performers, if you know who they're going to be. But for me, you know, if I was writing something for an amateur group, what I don't want is to write something that I think is really easy for them. Yeah, I absolutely. I don't want to quote dumbed down stuff just because I think they're going to have trouble playing that rhythm. Oh, let's make it really simple. Also, you know, if someone, especially in an amateur context, they're there because they want to be there. So they want to get something out of it and they you know people challenges is is satisfying i have a last question what's your feeling about minimalist opera short answer it's not for me <laughs> <laughs> okay. Long, longer answer i i think that there is i know people who find it the most extraordinary art ever uh, ben thank you so much it's been brilliant talking to you thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a chat with me about all things to do with composition. Thanks for having me.